knows him to be the awesome, mighty victor today? The champion who's overcome for you. Several scriptures in Psalms. One that I love, and I want to read a couple of different just first verses. One is Psalm 124. It says, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. How many of you know Jesus? He won the victory so that he, man, he's for you, not against you. He's on your side. He's with you. Another scripture in just a couple chapters over says, they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever and forever. And if you back up to Psalm 121, the scripture says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Isn't that good news? He doesn't sleep, will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thy, thee from evil. He shall preserve thy soul. And I love verse 8. Listen to this. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. That is the promise of the victor, our King, Jesus Christ. Would you give him praise this morning? Amen. Amen. We have so much to be thankful for. How many of you had a great Christmas? All right, all right. If you're standing close to somebody you love real well, just get a little closer and rub shoulders with them a little bit. Oh, I watched you all move. Awesome. Awesome. I want to go before the Lord in prayer right now. How many of you need God to touch in your family, in in your life? Amen. I'm believing, you know, I made the statement the other day that 2011 is going to be the year of heaven. And somebody was just like, what are you saying, Pastor? (laughs) I'm saying, I believe the Lord is coming back. I believe the Lord is coming back. So I'm just going to keep that, that, that theme going. Jesus is our awesome king. It's been good this month to celebrate him and to be ready for Christmas. And I trust you had a great holiday and that God was with you. It's so good to see you who are here today who braved the elements. Apparently a lot of folks didn't. <laughs> but that's all right. They're enjoying their holiday and staying safe and warm. And I think we'll get by. We'll be all right. Wherever two or three are gathered together in his name. He said, there he is. So we're here to worship the Lord. We're going to pray for the needs that you have in your life and my life. I had mentioned to you last week, and I wanted to reiterate, you know, several people had heard different stories. So I want to tell you what it is, because I always let just enough out that causes you to question more. Somehow in all of my very um, uh, quiet, demurring preaching, I have ruptured a vocal cord and uh, on my left side here. So I need you to pray for me. I'm not... Brother Brad is going to be preaching for me this morning, and he did a wonderful job at the 8.30 service. And so I am kind of, I was ordered not to speak for six weeks, and I said, good luck. <laughs> Nay, no way. But he uh, let me know that if I don't sing, and I just kind of, he said, you're going to have to become a little more Episcopalian. And so over the next, for the next couple of weeks, I shall be a little more liturgical. I'm kidding. I'm taking this week to get completely rested, and then next Sunday, the fire's back on. So I'm asking you to pray for me, and that's the news. That's what it really is. It's not that nothing else. I didn't lose my voice and all that, but God is with us, and God can take care of it. How many of you believe he can? He can, and he can take care of your needs as well. So as we go before the Lord this morning in prayer, we go in confidence and in faith, knowing God is an awesome, mighty God, and he is able to do anything. I expect great things this year. I expect that we're going to move into ministries such as we never dreamed would have been possible. And I'm believing that God is going to keep leading us. And that involves you and I. So let's pray right now for the needs that we have. Father, 
as we come before you, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house. We thank you, Lord, that you are our God. You're our deliverer. And, Lord, we can trust in you. No matter what situations, storms, troubles, trials we find ourselves in in this life, we are a people of thankful hearts because we have a God who is able to minister to every need. I pray this morning that you will touch every hand that was lifted up, every life, every heart, every situation as we give it to you this morning. We come in faith knowing that our help comes from the Lord. And we have great confidence in who you are, my Father. We just pray that you'll now minister healing and deliverance, that you'll touch your people with provision, that you'll lead them and you'll guide them all along the way. As we look to you and we thank you, we come thanking you and praising you because you declare in Joshua that when we call upon you, you will hear us. And so we give you great honor and glory today and all of the praise for it's in that name, that name that first came so many couple thousand years ago to Bethlehem, that name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ. We give you honor, we give you praise today, and the people of God, as we pray in the name of Jesus, said amen. Amen. Would you one more time just give him great praise? Would you help me to do that? Amen. He is worthy of our praise. You may be seated. So many of the holiday celebrations were so wonderful around here. Um, just want to remind you of this coming Wednesday night. Liz had already mentioned it, but it is a special time for our church. Last year, we, we brought all of the families and we ministered. We had several tables set up and our pastors and staff was here today, here during that time. And we prayed over your family. We anointed them with oil. We had communion together with just your family as you came in together. And we start at 7 o'clock, and we'll go until we're finished. But it was just such a special time, and I can't, I, what I remember the most about it was leaving out of here thinking, wow, how sacred that was, and how awesome it is to pray over your family and anoint them with oil for the coming year. So you want to come by Wednesday night. You only need to come by for a few moments. You don't have to stay. There'll be some, there's some that come and stay and stay in prayer, and that's fine. You can do that as well. But you're welcome to be here this Wednesday night, starting at 7. You can come anytime during the hours, anytime. We'll be here till probably around 9 o'clock. You can just come by and have prayer and communion with your family. And it's a beautiful way to start the new year. See, Sister Phyllis is out here. Good to see you, our friend. Would you help me to welcome Phyllis? She's with us today. Thank you so much for being here. I know you're here to see a beautiful little grandbaby. And that's wonderful. All the way up from, you're in northern Ohio. You come down here to the warmth and tropics, haven't you? Yes, exactly. I heard it snowed in Atlanta this, this weekend. For Christmas, it, it snowed. I'm telling you, it's awesome. Beautiful, beautiful weather. Our ushers are coming to serve you. And as they do, I would remind you that uh, this is your last opportunity to give in this, this end of 2010. If you're here Wednesday, you also can drop an offering by. And some folks like to know that because they take care of end-of-the-year donations. And so we're certainly in the receiving mode to help the ministries here at our church. All the loose offering, as always, will go to World Missions. We have several missionaries around the world that we support. And what you give today will go to help them, to bless them at this holiday season. Also, as you pay your tithes today, that helps to keep the lights on here and keep the ministries in Middletown alive and well. So as you give, give as unto the Lord, knowing that God uses you and me. Father, we come before you. We thank you. We give you great praise and honor for the way that you bless the church, that you touch the church. I pray now for our missionaries around the world that you will touch them. Use us, Lord, to bless them and to meet the need in their life. Pray that you will minister now, Father, to those who are regular to pay their tithes. For, Lord, this is a blessing in our personal lives that help us to understand the way your economy works and the way that your kingdom works. And so we're grateful, Father. Bless those who are able to give. Bless those, Lord, who want to give and cannot. Please bless them, Lord. Understand, God, you are the one that gives. And, Lord, we thank you that as we give back today, we give knowing that you use us to meet needs. In Jesus' name, amen. Doesn't they sound beautiful this morning? Kwame, I have to say, you are phenomenal. He was able to come uh, this Thursday for Fusion and, and share with us, and, and he did a great job. 
And what's interesting about it is not only is he talented in doing it, he's taken a gift that God has given him. And he's worked and excelled in that to give it back to the Lord. And, and he's anointed to do so. And it's, it's encouraging because as beautiful as that sounds, each and every one of us have a gift of some sort that God's given you. His desire is that you would give that back to him to be ex- excellent. Go over and beyond what's expected of you and, and to, to use that for his glory. And every single person has one of those gifts. It's good he found his, and man has he found it. Many of you, same, same, same story. You find out what exactly God is calling you to do and, and step out in it and allow him to sharpen you and to anoint you for it. If you would this morning stand in reading of God's word, and if you would open up your Bibles to John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. I take it you had a wonderful Christmas. I know I did. Uh, my newborn is, as Pastor says, meatloaf. Uh, she doesn't, you know, she just sits there. You just hold her and, and bake her and take care of her, and she's easy as gold. But the, uh, the two and a half year old, that's where the fun is. Because last year during Christmas, she was a year and a half, and she didn't quite fully understand what Christmas was, and there's presents, and she just liked to open presents that were shiny and cute, and she loved it, and of course we had to help her. Well, this Christmas, there was no helping her. Uh, She wanted to open up my presents and her mom's, and had to tell her to simmer down. She's an overachiever, and and she just loved it. She's excited, and uh, and it's good because today we get to go visit more family, and uh, I It's awesome. John chapter 3, verse 16 through 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Lord, we thank you this morning you did come. Thank you for the way you came. We thank you for the service. We thank you even though the roads, the snow's coming down and the roads may be a little bad, but God, it's still beautiful. It's so awesome. We can look out and see your splendor and your glory. Father, I pray and I ask that you anoint me for the words that you have laid on my heart and help me to articulate those so that we can receive them. But God, I pray as much as you anoint me, anoint your people to hear the word. That, God, it just not be something we listen to, but, God, it's something we apply in our life. God, 2011 is coming very soon, and, and your heaven is coming very, very soon. In just a few moments, you will be here. Father, we want to be full of you and be prepared and ready. So, God, I ask that you anoint us to hear it, to apply it, to live it, that it may glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. God gave his son for us. Jesus gave his son, gave himself for us. Did not have to. Let me repeat that. He did not have to do that, but he chose to do so. And it amazes me when we look at the manger scene. I know Christmas is over, but really, as we have talked about before, Christmas is never really over. The music, the songs may be over, but Christmas should never be over in our hearts. Every day we celebrate the way he came. We celebrate the fact that he did come. We celebrate what he did while he was here for us. Luke chapter 2, verse 5 and, uh, or 6 and 7 says, So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him, for them in the inn. I find that amazing. I, I've been doing a study here recently about the whole Christmas story. And what I find amazing is you can look through the entire Bible and there's really only one minute verse, one small scripture that talks about the story of there not being room in the inn. I get nervous, and there's a way I trick you to make it sound like I'm. All right, is that better? That's better. So here's what I've done. I've done this research and try to figure out, now I can move, 
um, I try to think as though if I was in every, every other person's perspective, as though if I was Mary or Joseph or even Jesus, if I was the innkeeper, if I was diff- the three wise or the wise men, it doesn't necessarily say three. I try to figure out if I was there, what was the scene really like? I try to picture it and put myself there. And as I came across the innkeeper and this whole story about there not being room, it absolutely amazes me. If you go into Walmart or wherever you go looking for cards, you see this manger scene. And the scene is they're in this horse stall, and it's just this wooden thing where they're sheltered and covered and nice and cute, and it's nice and warm. But the truth is it was nothing like that whatsoever. What happened back then is when they would take animals and put them in shelter, it was usually in a cave. And here this innkeeper says, I have no room. I have this place for you. You can go over here, and you can stay in this place. It's this little cave. And many of you can picture that as being cold, dark. Think about the floor. I mean, it's ro- it's got to be rock hard. It's not comfortable. And I know through the two children that we've had, I've, I know when you walk in the hospitals, they're clean, they're neat, especially when they're the ones for where people are about to, to have a, a baby. And they're all clean, and everyone's wearing gloves. They got, it looks like uh, with our first kid, I mean, they had masks on. They were just loaded top to bottom. They were just clean. And everyone talks about how important you got to wash your hands every time you hold a baby, and, and you got to be clean and all that stuff. But imagine Jesus was going to be born in a cave. The Redeemer of the world, the Savior of our lives, existence. I mean, what's amazing is if you look in in John chapter 1, 1 through 5, it amazes me that scripture. It says, in the beginning was the Word, meaning Jesus. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I find it so amazing. We forget sometimes Jesus was not just baby Jesus. You may watch Talladega Nights, and they refer to sweet baby Jesus. He doesn't always stay sweet baby Jesus. He grows up and becomes the man that saves the world. He was there with God. And everything was created by him and through him. And without him, nothing else was made. So in other words, the very cave he chose to be born into, he created. The breath you're about to take is a breath that Jesus and God has allowed you to have, that they have given, created oxygen for our being. And I find it amazing that here is this man, this innkeeper, who's absolutely oblivious of the miracle that's just about to take place in a few moments. It's right there in front of him. This couple comes in and says, we need a place to stay. We're about to give birth. And his response, we assume, is, I don't have any room, but you can go hide out in this cave. That's amazing. Jesus could have chose to be born through a different line. He could have chose to be born in a palace where there were many people there to attend to Mary and take care of her and Joseph. You know, I think about it as the innkeeper. If he knew Caesar Augustus was going to be there, he's the one that was going to be coming in. He would have given up his own room. Imagine if you were the innkeeper and you knew what was going to happen. You would give up your own room. You would give everything. You would give food. You would serve them. You would see to it that everything went great. But here he is, he's so full of the world and everything else, he cannot even see the miracle that's about to take place. It's right in front of him. And many of us in our own lives, we're so swamped by this world, we're so full of this world, and we don't even see the miracle that is taking place at this very moment. Jesus is coming in a few moments. The question is, are you ready? Are your loved ones ready? Are you really, really ready? We get so used to Christmas and and the whole presents, and they are fun. I love them. We got New Year's coming up, and New Year resolution. We're going to go do things and plan things. We get so busy with work, with family, kids, school, church. Sometimes 
We need to stop everything and get right back to the basics and just be open and full of God. But it's so hard to be full of God when we're so full of everything else. Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? And in this story, if you can imagine the picture, if I was the innkeeper, I would give everything for him to, to make it make it comfortable. I would feed. I would do whatever I could. But he's absolutely oblivious to it, has no clue. And as we go on and, and study the scripture, you put yourself, I thought, what if I was Joseph? You know, I'm a father now. If my wife was about to give birth and I walk into a hotel or any place like that and the manager says, I have no room, I'm like, dude, do you see my wife? She's about to give birth to the man who's going to save your life. You better find a place for me to stay. You know, he'll remember. I mean, I could, I could just imagine if I was Joseph, I would say, are you serious? Listen, she's pregnant. She needs a place to stay. You have no room? You're so full that you have no room for him. Are you kidding me? Well, I'll remember that when he's born. You may not make it to heaven. I, mean, I would use my position to get me a place to where I'm like in central air. I've got food. I'm hooked up. But it didn't happen that way. And Jesus chose to be born that way, to be right there in the midst with us. He chose to be born in a dark, dirty, disgusting cave, cold and bitter, much like this world, to be born right here with us in this dark, bitter, nasty, dirty, smelly cave. Animals, smelly. Just imagine what was going on in there. And yet that's where he was born. The most humbling state possible because he loves us that much. He would go through everything just like us. That amazes me. And as we look further and see the whole story as it wraps together and unfolds, we see it's, it's much like in our own lives I wanted to bring like the bale of hay and have a big old illustration and I thought it would be dirty and it was cold, it was snowing, I didn't do it, but I think you got the picture of what I'm trying to say. And what happens just like the innkeeper, it happens in our own life. And if you can be honest, you could probably raise your hand, please don't, and say, you know what, there's been times in my life I've been so full of everything else, my schedule, life, everything in existence, I have to do that sometimes I forget about what it's all really about. Become so full of this world that maybe God's trying to speak or try to tell me something and I just can't hear him because I'm so full of everything else that even in my own life, there's no room for him. I'm a Christian, but in a way, we make it to where there's no room for him because we fill ourselves up with everything else. We wanna have what everyone else has. We gotta keep up with the Joneses or keep up with the Kardashians or keep up with whatever it is we got to go have the nicest things. we got to go do the greatest things. And he's like, what about me? We all get to a place. This world is infiltrating you every single day. And the enemy is coming in every single day to get you off the focus. Your, your temptation may be different than mine. But nevertheless, his idea is to get you off of Jesus and onto something else. So full of something else that you're not available to listen or to receive from him. And I remember my own life, seven, almost seven years ago when I first got saved, I was so nice to people. You know, when you first get saved, all those emotions are coming through. You love people you hate. You know, you, you just are loving. You're, you pray harder. You're... God, it's all day long about God. You cannot stop coming to church. I find it amazing when I work with people in discipleship, it's like the first thing they say when they get saved, they're like, wow, I'm glad we have church tonight. I wish the church was open every day. And part of my mind, I'm like, me too, but, you know, when you're in it for like three years, you may not want to be at church every single day. But you know what? I remember when I first got saved, I couldn't be at church enough. I couldn't be here to worship enough. I couldn't hear the word enough. I couldn't read enough. I, couldn't, I had books, little, uh, whatever they are, paper 
boulder folder things, just papers filled up where I would read Romans and go through and take notes and figure out my own life. I went out and got the application study Bible and figured out how does this apply in my life and did that for pages and pages and books of it. And over time, I just started doing devotions. I study, I read, I pray. And it's not that I don't love God, but I get so full of everything else that I feel like maybe I don't need God as much. What happens is we get so hungry for something that's artificial. You, maybe you heard me a few months ago on a Sunday night, I preached about traps. And I talked about a certain trap. If you go into hotels or, or colleges, colleges are trying to earn your business. They want thousands of dollars coming in. And you're making a decision. Do I give them thousands of dollars to go to the Ohio State University? Which if you go anywhere else, you're wasting your time. Except for Lee. Maybe Lee, I guess. I'm just an Ohio State fan. I love them. But they want your money, and you're going through the halls, and they cannot get you to come to their college if there's rats running around, right? You're going to be like, wow, what's wrong with this place? My dorm is infested with mice and rats. And so what they do, you can't put out little rat traps because that looks nasty and disgusting. So instead, they put out food for this rat or for these mice. And this food is like so desirable. It tastes so good for those little rodents that that's the only thing they will eat. They won't eat anything else but this type of food. They have to have it. And they will go in and feed on it and get full and full and full. But the thing about this food is there is no nutrition whatsoever. So they think they're full and they're eating and eating and eating, eating but the truth is they're starving inside. They're never quite filled. And they'll eat and eat and they'll end up dying of starvation. Christians, many of us look to the world to fill us and fill us. And you know what? Let's be honest. It is tempting. It is desirable. It is good for a season. And we have to have more and more. When you open that door a little, it's more and more and more. And you're never full. You're always starving for more. And in the end, unless things change, you end up dying of starvation. And what happens to us Christians is we open up that box, that Pandora's box, as we open that door and step in and start eating this over and over. It's like, and I, I, about a year ago, I, I preached about Chinese food. I love Chinese food. If you go on the Internet and our website, which I assume all of you do because you can pay your tithes through the Internet or our website, it's awesome, it's great, it's easy. If you go in there and you look at the staff bios, my favorite place to eat is not Carabas, it's not Maggioni's, it's not Olive Garden, it's the Golden Dragon right here in Middletown. If I can eat anywhere, it's the Golden Dragon in Middletown. But you know what I find out they do? They're tricksters. Because when you're pulling up, you smell it, and your mouth starts watering. And you go in for lunch and pay $10 for a lunch, which I find amazing. How do you charge $10 for a buffet? You go in, and I'm not like, and many of the, there's no one that weren't here last time, but I get a plate, and it's like a monster plate. And I lay that plate down, and I go back and get another plate, because I don't want to make more than one trip. I just want to sit there and have a feast. And I'll make my trip, and I have my plates full of my food. And my I love it. My mouth is watering, and yours probably is too, and I'll probably see you after church at China Buffet, because last time I did that, I saw like 20 of you there. And they're like, man, you said that. That's what I was craving. But what happens is I'll go in, I'll eat, and I'll eat. Do you know, I don't know if they do it now, but they used to put fillers in it. So you won't eat as much. You get full quicker. But then two hours later, you're hungry again. And I can go back and eat Chinese food again. I'm not going to pay the money, so I don't. So instead, I really eat just to get me by for two hours, and I go home and, and right through the kitchen. And that's exactly what happens in our own lives. And because we're always wanting more, and we're never full, and we're always needing more, we fill ourselves up with so much in this world, we're not open for God to do anything in our life. Ministry, doesn't matter what it is, it's, I can't right now, I'm too busy, I got work, I got this, I got this, with the family, it goes on and on and on. And what happens is we become bitter and we become stale. The other day I come home, I'm hungry, I haven't ate all day, I'm preaching a message about food, someone's hungry. 
And I go home and I open that kitchen, or the, the refrigerator, and there's usually nothing in there. Disgustingly enough, I shouldn't say this, but we've had a ham in there since Thanksgiving, and I just threw it away. So I'm going in there, I'm looking for food, I'm hungry, and I don't want to cook nothing because that's too much work, and I'm hungry right now, and I see the golden treasure box, La Rosa's. And you know La Rosa's pizza's good after it's been sitting in the refrigerator for like three days. It's awesome. So I get the box out. I lay it on the counter, and I'm like, oh, it's a feast. I can't wait. It's heavy. I open the box up, even better. La Rosa's garlic bread. Now, I don't know if you've ever had their garlic bread. It is awesome. And I'm looking at it, and I can smell it. And I'm like, oh, honey, you're awesome. You ordered La Rosa's. I don't know what you did for lunch. You should have waited until I got home, but awesome. And I open the box, and I, I grab out, like, you know, there's like 10 in there, and I grab like 10, and I put them on a plate, and I put them in the microwave, because here's the deal, you don't want to eat cold bread, because it's hard, right? But if you warm it up, it gets better, better. Where's Phil? Is Phil still up there? He came out with an invention called the cookie humidor, which keeps your cookies soft, doesn't matter, it's pretty neat. So I put it in there, thinking it's going to be warm, and when I take it out, it's going to be nice and soft. I take it out, it's been there for a minute, Whew, burning my hand, but I'm like, I don't care, I'm so hungry, my mouth is watering, I got to get something. I take the biggest chunk out of that bread, and it about broke a tooth. It had been in there for so long, it didn't matter if you put it in the oven or not, it's rock hard. And the first thing I did, I was like, ah. do you know that's how God looks at some of us sometimes? He says, I'd rather you be war hot or cold. Many times, lukewarm, we become stagnant, we become stale, and right then, he can't, it's one of those things, he's expecting it, because on the outside, I look like a Christian, but on the inside, that's not there, and he can't help but spit it out. And many of us think we're good, we think we're doing fine, everything's all right. And one day, some of us, he's going to look at and say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I knew you not. I didn't know you, and you look at that word, it means intimately. I didn't know you intimately. And there's so many times in my life I want to go back, and I really want to have, and I know it's bad, I guess. I want that emotion that I had when my life was completely changed because it was my first love, and to this day it's still my greatest love. I want to come back to where I can't help but in my car want to raise one hand, not two, but one hand, when I'm listening to 93.3 instead of 102.7. Or, or I love Jim Rome. Instead of listening to Jim Rome, I put on Christian music. I want to find ways to love him and to worship him again and be hungry for him. Because you know what? When God moves in, and we have those Holy Ghost services, or when you're in here and you just feel his presence, I leave, I'm full. And you know what? I really am full. This world will never fill you. It'll always leave you wanting more. And what will happen is you'll become that stale, that hard piece of bread. You'll go to work, and I love this. I've had a lot of jobs. I always hop from job to job to job to job. I'm not saying that's a good thing. That's a bad thing. I just, it's weird. I just can't stay at a place. <laughs> and no, I have not been fired, so stop saying that. You're looking at me like I've been canned. I've never been canned. I just move on. But everywhere I go, if they find out I'm a Christian, they love to give me their opinion of what life is. This is how life is. This is how you should live your life. You're too serious. You know what? It's not wrong to do some of these things me and my buddies do. I don't care what you do. I know the difference between what's and right because the word of God says so. And so many people who don't know God, I love how they love to tell me about God and what religion is. And they don't even read the Bible. You know what I'm talking about. And I want to be like, dude, I, I'm not going to pick on you. Dude, you don't even read the Bible. Why are you trying to tell me stuff about it? But you know, you'll hear enough of that, it almost starts coming in. And then they hit you with this move. Well, you're just not open-minded enough. You're closed-minded. Okay, fine, I'm closed-minded. 
but at least I'm going to heaven. I'll go, I'll go to heaven, close-minded, fine. Listen, don't allow the world to pull you down. You either lift them up or you move on. We're supposed to love the world, to care for them. But you know what? The enemy will use them to tear you down, to get you confused. When you become stagnant, when you become stale, and you don't feel a, in love with God like you used to, you're open. And that's when those people the enemy will use to get you confused and wonder, is God really loving? If God's such a loving God, why would he allow this to happen? If God's such a God, then w can you explain this? There are so many people who think they know everything about the world. If they would just read the Bible, they'd understand about the world. Don't fall into it. Don't allow that trap to come in your life where you get hungrier and hungrier and you're never fulfilled. Listen, they sung the song, it's going to be all right. You may go through a rough time, a very hard time, and you're looking for an answer. Jesus Christ is the only answer. The world can tell you there's this outlet, this drug, this can make it better, this will help you to sleep better, this will take care of that issue. But at the end of the day, there's only one answer. There's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There is absolutely no other way. And anyone who tries to tell you otherwise have no clue about life. This morning, it's the end of Christmas, and we're about to go into New Year. I don't know what your challenges are for yourself, what you want to do. You want to save more money. You want to accomplish this. You want to go on this vacation. You want to save up this or that. But this year, I want to challenge you to fall in love with God all over again. And I mean absolutely in love with him. I, last night, we spent Christmas with everybody and done everything and ran around. And I went home and um, wherever Gary's at, I'm ready. You're high, you move. You're over there. I went home and I was laying down in bed and I was thinking about this morning and I was thinking about how crazy everything's been recently. I mean, it's Thanksgiving, it's holidays, it's, you know, do you get presents for people and how much do you spend? Because if this family member finds out you spent more on them than you did on someone else, they're going to be upset. And then you got this and then you got those family members you really don't want to see and then on and on and on. It's stressful time. We're about to go into a new year where we're supposed to be making decisions for 2011, going to heaven, whatever it is. We want to do new things in ministry. We want to build a building. We want to do a lot of stuff. We want to win the lost. And last night I thought, I was like, God, it's overwhelming how much work there is to do. It's overwhelming everything that's going on in my own life, the family, the kids. I mean, yesterday was one of the greatest times of my life, sitting there watching my two-and-a-half-year-old just open her presents. It was fun. It's life. It's a gift God's given me, and I enjoy that gift. But you know what? It can be stressful. Everything can just weigh you down. And I remember I was just praying, and I said, Lord, I don't want to be weighed down, and I don't want to be so full of this world or so full of things are just not you. I want to be so full of you. I don't want to not do bad things just because someone tells me to. I want to be in so love with you that I don't want to do things that are not of you. I mean, people will tell you what's right, what's wrong, but the more you fall in love with God, the more you just know, I want to do the things of God. I'm not hungry to listen to that or to go there to do that or even hang out with those people. Not because someone told me, because I'm so in tune with him, I know what he wants for me in my life. I said, Lord, it's just stressful. It's a lot of stuff we're doing. It's so much. And I sat there with my little two-and-a-half-year-old, and I just started praying. And I said, God, I want to be sensitive to you. I want you to make my heart pure, soft, not hard, not bitter, not cold, not dark. I want to love people like you want me to love people. I want to love you. And I know it's impossible, but God, I want to love you like you love me. 
And man, I just couldn't help but feel the presence of the Lord right there in my room last night. I thought, God, I want you so much. You know, sometimes I want him so much that I just wish he would just show up right now so I can just go to heaven. And he is coming. But there's a work for us to do in this time. I want you this year to not be so consumed of the world and so full of it that you don't see the miracle that's taking place right now in your very life. If you would, stand, please. This morning, I want you to I want you to think about that. I want you to think about in your life what things can you do less of and you can replace those more with God. Sometimes it's as easy as just raising your hands, doesn't matter where you're at, and just saying, God, this life you've given me does not belong to me. You've allowed me to live this life. But here soon, I'm going to have to give it back to you. Help me to make it one that honors you when I give it in return. If you're looking for an answer, and you're not full, and you just find yourself always needing more and busyness of the world, yet you're never fulfilled, Jesus is your answer this morning. Jesus is your answer for the rest of your life. And tonight, maybe you're one of those people, maybe you just came in here because someone drug you in here, or you've been searching, you just happen to show up. But this could be the moment in your life where you make the greatest decision you'll ever make. If you close your eyes, if the ministers would please come down to the front. This morning, if, if you're not full of God, you've, you're starving inside because you're so full of everything else, yet you're still empty. Yet inside, you're just starving and needing Him. He can fill you overflowing this morning with peace that you can't even comprehend or understand. This morning, if you need to give your life to Jesus Christ, I'd ask that you would reverently just step out from where you're at and come forward. We had someone in the 830 service get saved. Maybe this morning it's, it's your opportunity, this is your time to get things right with him. To never go back, to step forward in the new year and serving Jesus Christ. Is there anybody that would be bold enough to say, God, I'll step out. I'm ready to make a real decision to follow you. We're going to pray. And I take it that everyone in here is saved. And in the event that you're not, you're just too nervous, it's okay. We're going to pray regardless. And this is what it is. It's saying, God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. And I've tried it on my own and it's not working. I believe you died for me. And that you can forgive me. And you have to ask him to come to your life, to change your life, to be the Lord of your life. But here's what happens with this decision. You have to change. You no longer can be the person you were before. You can't carry half of yourself over and expect God to do miracles with it if you yourself are not willing to submit fully to his will. So we're going to pray, and if you would, repeat with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I believe that you did die on the cross for my sins. I ask you to come into my life, to change my life, and be the Lord of my life. And I will serve you the rest of my life, that it may honor you. Now strengthen me, Lord, and help me for this battle. In Jesus' name.